Hello, okay. folks. I'm Marcia Connolly. I'm one of the uh, members of the curriculum committee for the all organization. I'm glad to see you here with us. Uh, we will be recording this for folks to be able to watch on our YouTube at any future date. So feel welcome to share that with your friends and family. Uh, Wendy Servia is an advisor from Hospice of Michigan, and she's been assisting folks over the last 12 years through hospice and working with senior types of projects for 15 years throughout our area. She's going to be touching on subjects that uh, we begin to hear about with our health care providers as we age. So she's going to bring up a lot of uh, discussion, topics, definitions, etc. that will be helpful to us as we begin to note, negotiate some of our own journeys uh, through our healthcare. So Wendy, please um, take over and share with us so much of the information that I'm sure we'll benefit from. Thank you. Great. Oh, one more item. We also do want to encourage you to ask questions. Uh, Wendy would like you to do that throughout the presentation. And if you would just unmute, the microphone button on the task bar at the bottom of your screen that'll allow you to ask the question or if you prefer there is a chat function on that same task bar where you can type in your question and we'll be monitoring that to share with Wendy as well. Thank you. All right, is it there? Yep, it's yep. there. Okay, cool. All right, so hi everyone, I'm Wendy Servia. Um, I work for Hospice of Michigan. I'm just gonna, Marcia asked me to just give you um, a few tidbits about myself. Um, uh, she mentioned I've been working with seniors in Northeast Michigan for just over 15 years. Well, um, I have moved here 15 years ago, um, just sort of, and that's when I started my journey doing this. Uh, I describe myself often as a senior gusher, like, um, I was never a baby gusher. I was never into like babies walk in the room and I was always an old person gusher. So this is something that I've wanted to do forever. I've always been into, I had a grandmother that lived in a nursing home when I was in high school that I visited every single day um, after school. And I would go back to the rooms where she moved from to go visit the ladies that she used to live with. And it was just always me. Um, so I'm definitely in where I belong. <laughs> Um, it happened for a long time, so I feel very blessed to be able to do this. Uh, some of the few things that I do in the community is I am on the board of directors for the Senior Center. I've been on the board for about eight or nine-ish years. I'm a past president. I'm a current vice president of the Senior Center. Um, most of you guys know all the um, services that the Senior Center provides in our area, Meals on Wheels. They do like over 5,000 meals a month. Um, in Alpena County alone. So I'm definitely very involved and love every minute of it, of what we do at the Senior Center. I'm also a Rotarian. There's a fellow Rotarian on um, Bob Stacy. I'm on the board at Rotary and I'm currently um, the Rotary Club president, which is crazy to even say out loud. Um, but I love being a Rotarian and everything we get to do in the community. So I'm definitely out and about quite a bit. I um, am also married. I'm married to a Michigan State Trooper. He's a sergeant here at the Alpena Post. And I uh, have two children, a 17-year-old daughter, Savannah, and a 15-year-old son, River. So I'm a typical busy mom, and um, my husband would probably say I'm just crazy, which he's, he's true on. Um, but this is what I love to do, is help seniors. So some of the things we're gonna go through, um, Marsha mentioned, and that was in the description, but what I want to start with is usually I'm doing this in person. And I wanna find out where everyone is. Since there's only seven other people on here, um, I wanted to kind of hear from you. Is there, do you have any specific questions? I wanna make sure I touch on um, any comments or anything before I get going. I did put together about 10-ish slides, just so you're not just staring at me and you've got some reference points and we'll go through each of those topics. But is there something that, do you guys want to give me, um, ask me any questions right off to start off with, or let me know something that you want to definitely hear about? Wendy, I've got a question, and it sure. involves um, transitioning into either independent living first, then into, I guess the progression would be assisted living, and then- um, Good. <laughs> 
<laughs> that wasn't exactly what I was thinking, but um, Wendy, thank God you know him because I'm going to be embarrassed. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> okay. Perfect. So, just in general, like how that what that looks like. Yeah. Just in okay. general, that that at that time when you need to make a decision that you not necessarily can't take care of yourself, but you, your property is too much to take care of, and you need to downsize and be in a more reasonable living situation. That's okay. what I'm talking about. Okay, that's in here. So, um, definitely, we'll talk a little more in detail. Um, on that. Perfect. Does anyone else have anything they want to make sure I cover specific questions? Okay. So I'm gonna, oh. I, I have I have a question. This is Kathy and it concerns understanding the process with insurance with I get these statements from the insurance company that just totally don't make sense about how the University of Michigan Medical Health Care has billed X amount of dollars, 900, 1400, whatever, but the insurance covers zero and I cover zero. And I'm wondering how they can do that and how do they ever get paid? Do they ever get paid? And, there's, and they always come with a statement saying your request has been denied. And I'm, am I supposed to appeal the request so that they get paid? So I'd like you to touch on that if you could. So Kathy, that's a little bit out of my wheelhouse, but I'm gonna give you some, some tidbits and maybe we, we can talk about or do a few minutes afterwards that we could talk that I might be able to give you some resources that someone that could help you with that. Is that, we, I don't know if you're still there, Kathy? Did we lose Kathy? Uh, yes, let's see. <laughs> Are you able to stay on a few minutes after or contact me on the phone after? Uh, yes, I'm on, I'm on. I just had muted myself. Uh, so yes, I can, I can stay on depending on how late it goes. Perfect, well, let's, we'll connect afterwards. So that's like I said, a little bit too specific and out of my wheelhouse, but I wanna make sure I can at least maybe direct you in the right um, direction to get those answers. Okay, does anyone else have anything? I guess I'm with the one that wants to know about the types of uh, senior living and assisted living that we have in the area. I'm familiar with the nursing homes, but I'm not familiar with how many other resources we have in the area. Okay, perfect. I touched base on that. So when we get to that um, spot and really any time throughout this, please unmute and interrupt me. I talk a lot and I talk fast, um, but I will stop and I wanna hear um, your input, please. So I will, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about specific places that are available here and out in the Alpena area. Okay, so if there's not anyone else, I'll start with just kind of my basic little presentation here. Um, let's see if I can navigate this. Well, and it's not pushing the button. Oh, there it goes, okay. Actually, I needed to go back. I apologize. I'm a little wonky at this too. I'm on this uh, virtual cart here, so it's a little bit different than being on my laptop. So let's see if I can get this to go again. Okay, the first thing I want to talk about is advanced care planning. Um, sometimes you'll see the initials ACP, so that's why I put that out there and what that stands for. Advanced care planning, I cannot say this enough and stress this enough, that it is, it is extremely important that we have this conversation. Advanced care planning does not have to be extremely formal. So a lot of us have um, met with maybe an elder law attorney, and you have maybe a trust written up, a will written up, um, power of attorney written up, and those are all great things to have, but what we lack in our, um, I would say just here in America, is we don't talk about end of life. We don't talk about what are our wishes and what we actually want. Per se to our healthcare, we talk a lot about I want this tea set to go to my granddaughter and I want this to go here, but we don't talk about what are our wishes with our future of our health care as we age. It's a conversation that I'm going to be quite honest and Bob, don't mention this, I mentioned Randy, but um, 
my husband is also extremely uh, uncomfortable having this conversation. Here I work in hospice. Of my parents, it's been years to get them to talk about what are their actual wishes. So advanced care planning is the plan to provide us direction in our health care. Um, it lets us know when we're not, if we're ever not able to make decisions for ourselves. One is who do we want to empower that person to make the decisions for, our, for ourselves? And have we told them what we want? Um, so I'm going to go through some of, some of the basics of that, and we're going to talk about how you can actually do that on an exam paper. So the first thing I do is um, you want to think about the future. What's most important to you? What do you want to happen? Or do, what do you not want to happen if you become unwell? An example I often give, um, just between my own friends, is that the day that we're born, we all know that we are going to die one day. So that's the reality, but we don't talk about it in our culture. We talk about things like, as soon as someone's pregnant, I mean, many of us have had children that are on here. As soon as you're pregnant or your spouse is pregnant, you start talking about that pregnancy, you start talking about that birth, where you immediately decide if you want that baby to be born in a hospital or at home or whatever that might be. But we don't talk about how we want to die. As uncomfortable as that is, it's something that we need to talk about. Um, you want to have those conversations with family and friends, obviously your most intimate um, circles. And you want to choose someone to be a patient advocate. To actually be a patient advocate, um, there are forms that you can get at the hospital. There's a state of Michigan kind of standard patient advocate form. And there's a brochure at the hospital that actually has a booklet that has you go through and talk about um, things that you want and things to think about. And you want to, it gives you a chance to record those things. I will say to people, it really doesn't matter if you have it written down on a piece of scrap paper or on a cocktail napkin. If you have them written down, one is it forces you to talk about it think about it, share that with your patient advocate, and then it's documented. That discussion may also include a question about a DNR. So a DNR, um, I think most of you have heard that term DNR, do not resuscitate. It's something that you can talk about continuously. So when you're talking Talking about um, advanced care planning, the, 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 the process is ongoing. So my husband and I can have a conversation right now in our 40s about our advanced care plans, and it's going to look very different than when we have that conversation as we age. Because now at 45 years old, I want to be a full code. I don't want to have a DNR. I want them to try everything because I'm not aware of a terminal diagnosis if something were to happen. Um, to me today or to my husband. So today, my advanced care plans look very different than they may look when I'm 95 years old. So at 95 years old, I may very well have a DNR that says if my heart stops and things go awry and I'm in the hospital, I don't want to be resuscitated. I don't want to be hooked up to machines. I don't want all of that. Um, so the key to advanced care planning is to have those conversations continuously. Now, you should be talking it every night at the dinner table, but every couple of years or as things change, if there is an illness or a diagnosis, it's a good conversation to have again and review that regularly. What one thing that I often tell people as well is your patient advocate does not have to be your spouse. I think that's always like assumed that it should be your spouse and people might even feel bad if it's not your spouse. Um, but many families that I've worked with, spouses aren't always the best decision makers when there's a crisis going on, and they may not carry out what your wishes are. So I have dealt with people through the years that even has inspired me with certain things. Sometimes I have seen a girlfriend, like a best friend, be a patient advocate that stepped in to make the decisions because those two women had a conversation and they knew what she knew what she wanted. She shared that with her girlfriend. I do not want to be resuscitated in this example. And she was able to say, no, she doesn't want to be resuscitated, where the husband really had a tough time to um, continue with that as the plan, the treatment plan. Um, so your patient advocate does not have to be your next of kin or your spouse. It can be whomever you choose just as long as it's documented and they're aware of it. 
I've also ran into uh, situations where someone chose a patient advocate and never told the person. You can't really do that. <laughs> so it's kind of like a waste of time. If you didn't tell them and share, now they're kind of surprised that they're the patient advocate. Um, that happened with a child one time and they were surprised, but they didn't have the discussion um, with their mom at that time to actually find out what her wishes are. So advanced care planning, the key is to have the tough talks, um, to document it and have a talk with the person that you're telling, they're asking to be your patient advocate and give that person a chance to agree to be the patient advocate. Some people are not comfortable making those decisions um, when it's happened. So that's another thing is to make sure that is truly what they want. And maybe they need some time to think about it. Even if it's your spouse, that's something that they should decide on. Do they want to have that? Um, do they want to make those decisions for you? So there are some differences between power of attorney, patient advocate, and I also want to talk about a funeral, funeral representative. So power of attorney, and I'm not an attorney, but I'm just going to tell you just the basics of it, is a lot of people have um, power of attorney written up for both health and finances. Sometimes it's the same person, sometimes it's not. When it comes to health, a power of attorney, um, the paperwork is not enacted or activated until two doctors actually say that you're unable to make decisions for yourself. The same goes for a patient advocate. So that patient advocate is not going to step in until you're not able to make decisions for yourself. So there are many times that POAs and uh, patient advocates are never even used um, because someone's able to make decisions for themselves all the way up to the end of life, which is a blessing, of course. Um, but there are times that someone is not able to. I would say often there's time. So dementia, anything with cognitive abilities, like we've all, I'm sure, been touched by certain things that um, someone's unable to make a decision for themselves. But a POA or a patient advocate is not going to be enacted until two doctors say that that person is deemed incompetent. Um, the other uniqueness with POA power of attorneys or patient advocates is that that job stops when someone passes away. And something that we run into in hospice is that people assume, again, that when they pass away, then their funeral arrangements are going to be carried through the way they want it. Even with a prepaid funeral, you still need to um, empower someone to make those decisions for you. So a lot of times it's just next of kin. It's a spouse, it's a child that then will make those decisions on the, at the funeral home. But there is something new in the state of Michigan, it's just new for the past few years, that you can actually fill out a form that's a patient representative. You can get those forms through an attorney, elder law attorneys are aware of them, but also funeral directors are. So if you go for a prepaid, prepaid funeral, you can ask about the funeral representative form. And what that does is that is not enacted until the patient passes away, until the person passes away. And then whoever's um, deemed the, the funeral representative then makes the decisions about the funeral. It cannot be a healthcare worker and it cannot be the funeral director. So you do need to choose someone, but it does not have to be next of kin. So it doesn't have to be your spouse. So I give another example that my mom will often, <laughs> I tease her about, is my mom does not want an open casket. Of course, as her daughter, and as silly as I am, I like to um, drive her crazy and tease her at times that she'll get whatever we get in the end because we'll be making the decision. She won't be here to make the decision if it's open or closed casket. Um, but if she has a funeral representative paper filled out, that is the same as a patient advocate form. She's gonna have that conversation probably with my dad or with me that then would say what she wants and now person that's designated as the funeral representative would then carry through whatever her wishes are. The other caveat of that, that person is also responsible um, for paying for that funeral. So the funeral director has to speak to or have the contract which, which, with, which also is the financial part of it with that funeral representative to have the funeral. So if that's something that's important to you, it's just good to know a lot of people are not aware um, that there is such a form out there that can be done. 
and that you can actually choose someone to plan your funeral for you on your behalf that will carry through your wishes, similar to a patient advocate. Does any of that, anyone have any questions about patient yeah, advocate? What, what is the difference between, med uh, between medical power of attorney and patient advocate? They're pretty much the same thing. Um, they're just, uh, um, usually the power of attorney has, they're very similar. I'm not an attorney. I'm sure there's some kind of little detail in there, but medical POA and a patient advocate are primarily the same thing. It's just a lot of people um, will go through an attorney to get the power of attorney set up, the medical, where a patient advocate has the same power as long as the, the, the form, the state of Michigan form is properly done, um, filled out, but they can actually just pick up that form online at the hospital um, and they don't have to go through the attorney. Okay, so here's why I'm asking. My dad died last year. He had a medical power of attorney for one of my siblings, but when we got to the, well, my mom first and then my siblings, when we got to the hospital, mom had to fill out a different form specifically with the DNR thing. And I don't know if that's because we didn't do something the right way. No, not at all. It's just a DNR form is completely separate. So even gotcha. though you, the POA is just choosing the person that's okay. gonna make the decisions for you when you're deemed incompetent or unable to make decisions, and the DNR form is just that, it's a separate form, a do not resuscitate form, um, that whoever is the power of attorney for healthcare or the patient advocate is allowed to sign on behalf of the patient that's unable to. Okay, and if we wanted to pick up the patient advocate form, you said we can do so at the hospital? They have them at the hospital, um, yeah. So all the social workers, the discharge planners have them, but I bet they should even be um, at the main desk, you could ask for okay. that. Okay. And Wendy, have, is, there, is there any way to uh, download that form? Is it available online? There probably is. I'll find out for you. Okay. So the other thing about a patient advocate form, which is nice in our area being small, is that our hospital here in Alpena has software called Epic. The Epic software that they use is, is hooked through like the University of Michigan, they all use the same. The nice part about that is you have a patient um, file or chart that's, that's general chart. And if once you fill out that patient advocate form, you can actually have that uploaded, right? Just bring it into the hospital and they will scan that into your chart so that anyone will have access that's in Epic, which is nice. And a lot of people miss that part because they'll fill out the form and then what do you do with it? They'll have maybe give it a copy to their kid and then their child, now you're in crisis and the child's looking through paperwork and things like that. But if you actually bring that into our hospital, they can scan that right into your medical chart and it's already there. Just remember if you change any of your wishes or change your patient advocate, change your person, um, make sure you upload a new one into your chart at the hospital. So, Wendy, should you also give a copy of that to your doctor? You should. I think that's a great thing to do. I think it's um, for a couple of reasons. One is they know what your wishes are, and it forces you to have a conversation and ask specific questions. So, yes, you should bring that into your office as well. I feel like if you're going to pick between the two, the hospitals usually when you're in crisis mode and probably would get to a point where you're, they would see you in the emergency room and find that you were unable to make decisions for yourself, they would see that there. Um, but it's good for your doctor's office to have it and to have the conversation with your provider. Okay. Any other questions? All right, I'm gonna keep going. So what happens after you have a hospitalization? So this is, again, very generic and vague because every um, hospitalization is unique and things that could be, so I'm talking in very broad forms. But um, typically, a hospitalization that has three midnight stays. So is Marsha going to give me a heads up? Because that's like her old school, like I'm saying it the right way, <laughs> what Marsha used to do discharge planning. Three midnight stays is typically how Medicare looks at um, having a hospitalization that then would qualify you for like home care or therapy days, but really therapy days is the, is the key to this. Um, 
So when you go home from the hospital, if you have three midnight stays, there's some things and actually the three midnight stays is really only to a nursing home, but I want to talk even more so about what your choices are after going home or leaving the hospital. If you go home from the hospital, there's a few things that you might be offered. Home care. So home care would come to your home. They would see you for a very specific need. So I'm going to give you a broad um, reasons of why you might have home care. Some people have home care because they go home with a wound that isn't healing quite properly. So they would then go home with a home, home care. Home care would contact them. Here in our area, really in Alpena proper, we just have mid-Michigan um, um, home care. If you go a little bit north, like if you live in Presque Isle, um, McLaren has home care services available. And if you're a little bit south, um, there's also Heartland in our area that they can do um, home care. So home care can be nursing, where a nurse, a registered nurse would come to your home. And in that example, take care of a wound. Um, it also could be therapy, so physical therapy, occupational therapy, sometimes there's speech therapy that they'll do in home. It also could be an aid. An aid would take care of your personal care, and it also would provide social work support as well. And home care looks different for every patient, again, depending on what your need is. If it's a wound, it's probably just going to be a nurse coming in, maybe an aide help you get a, a bed bath. You might not ever see the social worker. You would have no other therapies. Maybe you're going home because they, you were in the hospital for two days and you got a little weak because you were in the hospital for two days because you had a fall. Maybe then they would call in a little bit of therapy. So maybe you would have therapy to help you transfer better to maybe get out of bed or get onto the commode a little bit easier. Again, very specific. It's very short term. I didn't even want to put a time um, because Medicare is changing so much. It is typically covered by Medicare. There are times where you have your co-pays and supplementals and things like that. That's again, out of my wheelhouse, but typically your home care is covered by Medicare mostly. It might be that 80 to 20, um, but it is a covered expense. Also home care is Monday through Friday, eight to five. There are times that people are on call for the weekends, but it's not a 24 hours a day where you can get a hold of someone. Sometimes you can get a hold of someone, but they might not send someone out. They might tell you to go to the emergency room or things like that. Private duty. You also can, can have private duty, which is non-skilled home care, come into your home and help. So in our area, private duty agencies are compassionate care, Wellspring Lutheran that you'll see, um, Leland Home Care, those are private duty home care that is um, available. That does not need a doctor's order, um, even truly a hospitalization to get private duty. But a lot of times people will hire private duty when their loved one is going through a few changes and they need some extra care. It could be as simple as they had a hip replacement and they need some private duty just to help because the spouse is unable to help as much. Um, or or it could be someone who is kind of getting closer to end of life and they are declining more and they do need extra help in the home regularly. Maybe it's getting out of bed in the morning or getting to bed at night. Maybe it's just a shower a couple days a week so they're having trouble getting into the shower safely. Um, it is private pay. It is not something Medicare covers. Long, some long-term care policies I ran in through throughout the years will cover some private duty. Um, it's I would say that some of the older policies in the 80s I saw covered more than the more recent policies, but it is out there that there are, it, there are some benefits. I didn't get into some of the weeds of Medicaid through NEMSCA covers some private duty. Um, also the VA, if you're a veteran, there are some um, uh, benefits through the VA that also will cover some private duty. So there are a few others out there, but in general, you're typically talking private pay. Um, Cost-wise, in our area, you can get private duty through, through the senior center is probably closer to $20 an hour, all the way up to maybe it's 16, even 16 to 20, all the way up to $25 an hour. Mm -hmm. But one thing to keep in mind is that um, they are people that are unskilled. They are not nurses. They are people that have had maybe about eight to 10 hours of training on how to help someone. It's similar to having a neighbor come over and help. Um, they know a little bit more, um, but they're not medical, medically trained people. They're typically not even a SENA, a certified nursing assistant. Any questions on home care or private duty?
right? I'm going to keep going. So another thing you could go home with is hospice. And I'll talk a little bit more about hospice at the end, um, but hospice is covered by Medicare, traditional Medicare. Hospice provides um, a little bit, not a little bit, a lot more than what home care would provide. It'll cover all of your DME, your durable medical equipment, which would be a bed, oxygen, walkers, wheelchairs, shower chairs. One thing I want to mention, a walker. Someone could be walking and shopping at Walmart and be on hospice. So just to keep that in mind, we'll talk about that. Um, medications are covered by your hospice benefit. It would include the medical director. So on our team here at Hospice of Michigan, we have Dr. Michelle Lefebvre. Um, is kind of behind the scenes, and she's our medical director for our team, registered nurse, social workers, hospice aides, spiritual care, and volunteers. So you get a lot of support, um, and we're available by phone 24-7. So that's a big difference than home care. I always say we're kind of like home care on steroids, definitely a step up um, with care. Any, any questions about just the basics right there about being at home? after a hospitalization. Okay, skilled nursing facilities. Um, skilled nursing facilities somewhere else, uh, you could also go. Now this is where you need that hot for Medicare to pay for a skilled nursing facility um, after a hospitalization. That's where you need those three midnight stays to qualify. Medicare covers on the right hand side, I wrote there, up to 100 days. I put an asterisk there because um, we don't see the 100 days very often anymore. It is re-evaluated usually every two weeks, sometimes even shorter I've seen. <clears throat> um, so Medicare is not really um, giving out those skilled days as easily as they were maybe even 10 years ago or less. Um, excuse me, I have a tickle. <coughs> the, um, going to a skilled nursing facility from hospitalization you are looking at therapy days. So that's where um, Medicare is going to cover that, but you need to participate in therapy. Um, you, they always have an RN, a registered nurse there 24 hours a day, and all the disciplines are available. So they also have medical directors or providers that will see patients while they're there at the skilled nursing facility, registered nurses, social work, physical occupational speech therapies. Again, that's where your therapies are involved. And a lot of times people after those three day stays well, not only need nursing, so maybe again, they might have a wound or other things going on, um, but they're also usually getting PT and OT is pretty common. Um, I often also describe that as um, a workout. So they're getting maybe three 15 minute visits where they're getting 45 minutes a day of a workout or two 15 minutes a day. So that would be like, when do you get on the treadmill and run for 45 minutes? There's a lot that goes into it. It's not just, um, I'm hanging out in the nursing home getting better. They're definitely working on their strength, they're walking, whatever their goal is, so that they're getting better. So Medicare does look at this. When I talked a little while um, about hospice, Medicare looks at going to a skilled nursing facility under therapy days as aggressive treatment. They actually look at that as someone's going to get better. So one of the things that the nursing home is always documenting is that progression of getting better. And there are times where a patient has a hospitalization, goes to the skilled nursing facility, and maybe they're approved for 30 days to be at the nursing, at the nursing home. But after two weeks, they see that the patient is not progressing, progressing and getting better, but they're actually plateauing or declining. And that's where Medicare then will step in and say, okay, there's no more skill days available. So again, back to that 100 days, they're not working, getting up there because they're not showing enough um, progression of getting better. So that aggressive treatment that Medicare is looking at is saying, this person's not getting better, this person's actually plateauing or getting worse, and therapy is not for them. Meals are also included, and medications are included when you're at the nursing, at the nursing home. Any questions about nursing home? Okay, I'm going to keep going. So housing, a few of you had questions about housing. So housing that's available for seniors in our area, um, there's a couple different levels. So the first one would be independent living. Can you guys hear construction going on? No? Okay, good. If you don't hear construction, there's like a drill going off on some, some all of a sudden outside my door. Um, senior apartments, independent living. A perfect example of independent living that we have here in Alpena are the Alpena Pines. 
Um, the Alpena Pines are located back behind the health department, um, behind the college off of, is it Johnson Street, Johnson and Woodward, um, the Alpena Pines apartments. That is independent senior housing that's here in Alpena. There's quite a few different independent housings in the area. Some housing is related to income levels, so that's something that um, if you need more specifics, reach out to me and I can give you those actual list. A lot of the housing in our area is based on income, but there is some independent, Alpena, some independent not related to income. Alpena Pines is a perfect example. There is an apartment complex that's there that does have some apartments because it is Mishta housing that are income based, but there are, I think maybe at one point there were seven apartments that were market value. And then there are condominiums that are there that you can also purchase and you were able to lease them as well that are independent senior housing. You have to be over the age of, I think it's over 55 or 60 to live in that complex. Um, you also, I mean, when we jump down to assisted living, both Turningbrook and Besser Senior Living, even though they're assisted living centers, they also have independent living in, in both of those buildings. So there are people that have moved into Turningbrook and now that have moved into Besser Senior Living, that are independent. They have their car there. They can come and go as they choose, but all their meals are there and they have an apartment there. Um, but that's where they choose, choose to live. Um, I'm going to go back to assist living here in a second, but AFC, we also have adult foster care in our area. There's two different types of AFC homes. There are um, AFC homes for people that are elderly. There's also AFC homes for people that are developmentally disabled. So we have both in our area. Um, the AFC homes that I'm referring to and, and obviously deal more with are the senior housing. Um, they do run about um, $3,500 a month to live in an AFC home. They're typically licensed for up to six people. There are a few that might be bigger, but most of them in our area have six residents that live there. And then someone that's there 24 hours a day. It's not a nurse, um, but it is someone that's there 24 hours a day in the home. A lot of them are more home-based, so they're actually homes that have been converted into AFC homes. They might be in the middle of a neighborhood even, so you might be driving by it and not even realize um, what it is, but there are AFC homes. A few of them in the area also accept Medicaid as payment um, for the monthly bill. Not all of them, but some of them do. Assisted living is typically a little bit more expensive. In our area, running about $4,000 on up, um, if you're more independent, it's going to be lower. If you are higher acuity and need more assistance, it's going to be higher. And those bills also will fluctuate as someone ages. So if they're needing more care, um, their bill will, will increase. The nice thing about that, though, is you can go in there. Um, maybe when you just need a little bit of care or you're pretty much independent, maybe you don't drive anymore or you're unable to make meals, but everything else is pretty normal. You still socialize. You still want to go to Big Boy once a week. You're going to Mass on Sundays. Um, your friends can pick you up or your family can pick you up, take you to Mass, take you to Big Boy, and then you live in assisted living where the rest of the time your meals are provided. If you if you do need some assistance, um, maybe it's just safety. Like when you take a shower, if you're afraid of falling, um, there is someone there that can help you. And as you age and need more assistance, they are there to provide more. So maybe it's getting out of bed in the morning and getting dressed. So in a few minutes when I talk, there's a mention about ADLs, are your activities of daily living. Um, the more time, the more you have need help with your ADLs, the assisted living facility is there to, and they're, um, they're, they're actually equipped to handle that. Um, they also will bring in agencies like hospice. We are the preferred provider in both of those buildings. So when someone is eligible to use their hospice benefit, again, they're aging in place. They're staying there and they're bringing hospice into the facility because that is their home. And back to um, nursing homes, the same, the same goes there where hospice is brought into the nursing home when needed as well. So nursing facilities would be the step, next step up from assisted living. There are times where patients get, um, their, too, their acuity gets too high where they do need added assistance and they do need to be in a skilled nursing facility. Um, the hard part with that, and to be quite honest, is financial, is finances. Um, fi financially, um, a skilled nursing facility is about $8,500 a month in the state of Michigan to live in a skilled nursing facility. 
So I just saw Susan's face. <laughs> yeah, eighty five hundred dollars a month to for learn skilled nursing. For, for skilled assisted nursing. nursing, yeah, assisted for one living. Per assisted living is like four is where it starts and goes on up. Skilled nursing, if you're going to go to the nursing home to live, is eighty five hundred a month. So big jump. Yeah. <laughs> um, and just to give you an idea of 24 hour care, if you have 24 hour care in your home and you use private duty, so if you want to stay in your house, but you need someone to stay with you 24 hours a day, so back to that previous slide of private duty, that's about $15,000 a month for someone to come in your home 24 hours a day. So that's based on about $20, $21 an hour. Wow. <laughs> Crazy, huh? Yeah. 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 But really, is our is there any place that um that there are guidelines for you to consider when you should make maybe that first move to independent living? Like give me an example so I make sure I'm answering properly. Um just like guidelines is what you should consider that you're not able to do anymore that you need assistance at what point is there guidelines that you can look at as to consider making that move you know i've never been asked that like i don't have any off the top of my head a formal like these are this is a check okay. sheet often that we run into or i run into even just out in the community is when people are to a point, like a lot of times it's their parents, for example, or an aunt that they're caring for, but there's a lot of, um, it's a more of a safety issue. Like there's been falls going on, maybe someone started like a little fire in their kitchen, um, they're not eating well, they're not taking their medications when they should. So maybe they had a fall, they can find out that they had a urinary tract infection, but they weren't taking their medications, they weren't eating well, so it was like this big cycle that happened. That's usually when people start having the talk of, one, do we need someone to come into the home just to start with and help mom or Aunt Sue kind of get things going? Or that's not enough, and now we're at the point where she really can't be alone. That's really kind of where a lot of people tend to make that decision. And I think a lot of it has to be because people don't want to move. They want to stay in their own home as long as they possibly can. Um, so there isn't like a check sheet. There are some families, though, that I ran into even recently that um, they've always talked about it. Again, go back to the advanced care plan planning. And they said, you know what? When we get to the point, we don't want to be a burden on our kids. We don't want to um, have them coming and helping us all the time. So we're going to make that plan to move into independent housing. And then maybe we're still driving or maybe we're not quite there yet. And they just made that decision. In our area, it doesn't happen as often because really the only choices you have are Buster Senior Living and Turning Brook. But like in Florida, where they have those huge complexes, you'll have people that will retire and they buy into a, a, a piece of it where they go in independent, knowing that they can add private duty when they need that, move into assisted living if they do, and then a nursing home even. It's usually all in the same property on the same complex. So you see that a lot more in Florida where people are a little more able to make that decision. We so, don't have we don't have those kinds of facilities in the Alpena area. We don't. There was discussion years ago um, back to Alpena Village. That was actually owned by Presbyterian Villages and it used to be Lutheran Homes of Michigan. Back where the pines were built, there were condos and the plan was, and this was about 20 years ago, was for that to happen. They started off with, a, uh, with independent living with the condos and the apartments. And the plan was to add assisted living and nursing home and it didn't just come, it didn't come to fruition. Um, I think a lot of it was the building, everything kind of stopped um, with, with um, construction and the real estate market kind of crashed and then people weren't going to nursing homes as often. We are finding though in our area, Besser Senior Living being brand new um, and now it's slowly you know, getting busier there. They're not full yet. And then actually in Rogers City this month, um, the Brook is opening up another independent assisted living. It'll turn into its assisted living um, facility. So it is happening, but not where it would go all the way through. Typically, um, Turningbrook, even it's been here the most, you can go into Turningbrook and they're great with bringing services in and people tend to stay there. Very, very seldom will someone leave Turningbrook and go to the nursing home, for example. Like usually they can bring in like hospice to help with care for that person and they'll live there for a long time. 
Okay. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> you did. You did. I, I, I guess I'm looking for just something that kind of gives you a, a talking points to consider between your spouse and or your family as to whether it's time to make that decision. <clears throat> that, yeah. I think that's more of like back to that advanced care planning is just to have talks. And um, mm -hmm. I, you and I, Kate, Bob knows how to get a hold of me. We can meet where I've got some ACP uh, materials that you can go through and talk about things like that. Um, and really, it's just it really is just that talking point so that if Bob is your patient advocate in that example, or maybe it's one of your kids, you can go through and actually have the conversation and you have your thoughts organized as to what you want. And again, yeah. again your plan, the plan might change five years from now, the plan changes. And that's okay. That's the whole point of it is to continue to have that conversation. Okay, thanks. You're I welcome. guess I was thinking that at some point we would be looking at independent living. But we've heard some uh, stories this last year because of COVID where independent living facilities have not shut down, but they've shut their people down. That's the, that's the truth, yeah. I guess but, I don't want to get into a situation where I can't go to church if I want or get in a car if I'm still capable and go to a restaurant. But apparently those yeah. people were not allowed to do anything. They were not. They and still are not allowed to have families in. So partly um, the way, AI, so uh, to get into the weeds a little bit, but is this a living small under um, the licensing in the state of Michigan under AFC? And the way the governor order is written under adult foster care, the way the order is written, they are not allowed visitors still. So they fall under the same as a skilled nursing facility. So the AFCs and the, and the SNFs all ended up in the same pot and they're not allowed. And it has been really, really hard, especially as a healthcare worker, um, to see a lot of those patients that have really declined because they have not been able to see their loved ones um, or leave, obviously. Like if you're independent, you can't leave. Um, and they're, they're attempting to keep those people safe because obviously it's a very vulnerable population, but um, it is tough. This is something that, you know, you guys know, none of us have ever seen. So people just, they don't know how to do it other than to lock it down and keep people safe. The odd part is though, is you still have workers going in and out. So what is yeah. that? You know, I can argue it both ways, but um, yeah. yeah, I get it. Any other questions? What are other right. options, though, if independent living is no longer desirable because of what COVID did to them? What, what options are available that would give a person the freedom they want? So other independent, than independent housing, so you could go, so at the, at the um, assisted living, which a lot of the assisted livings, like I mentioned, Turning Brook and Besser Senior Living, you can start off being independent, and then they do have assistance that's there. Um, so that's where you get stuck in that lockdown situation, like in the case with, with COVID, but independent housing. So if you moved into, like if you and Sue bought a condo over at the Pines, you would not fall under that, but you are there with other seniors. That's all. There are no families that live in that apartment building or in the condominiums. Families are not allowed. So you wouldn't be, you know, stuck with Wendy and Randy and their kids next door. You would be um, there with other other seniors. I know it'd be fun though, but you know, yeah, be, I'd be okay with you being next door, Wendy. It'd be fine. Randy yeah. can come too. So the independent living are just is all seniors, and then there are um, services available like private duty that can come in, so it can turn it into assisted living if you needed private duty, but you're still living in your apartment um, and you pay under that private duty, but you are living with all seniors. So there are senior housing. Again, for market value, unless you're Medicaid, um, we don't have a ton of options for senior housing um, in our area, but you tend to get like, I'm gonna say someone would kill me, but like Fox Farms has a lot of seniors there, but you don't have to be a senior in Fox Farms, like condos, um, where people just tend to live, you know, all near, they're all independent, it's all independent. That's just a condominium. And that really technically is not senior housing, it just tends to be a neighborhood that um, suits that community for sure. Um, but in our area, we only have really Alpena Village is the biggest, um, which is the Pines, the condos that are there, that it's really, truly senior housing only. Okay. Perfect. Um, so another big thing. So this is what I actually do um, for my regular full-time gig is palliative care and hospice care. 
Um, that's the new word. I wanted to add palliative care because how many of you, I mean, I can only see a couple of faces have heard palliative care, like just recently you hear that term and curious as to what it is. Has anyone heard that recently with anyone? Okay, maybe not. <laughs> so palliative care um, is something that we're hearing more of. It's just the term. It is, does mean comfort care. The big difference between palliative care and hospice care though, they're both comfort care. And when I say comfort care, the opposite of comfort care in our line of work is aggressive treatment. So when there is not anything else for a patient to pursue, then typically you're dealing with comfort care. You're just maintaining symptoms of, um, to keep someone comfortable. So you're maintaining those symptoms. An example with that would be, my a typical patient would be someone who's maybe 90 years old and has congestive heart failure or CHF, but they're also a diabetic. Maybe they're obese. You've got all these other things. Maybe they're a smoker and they have some COPD. They have all these other comorbidities. That's another word that we use. And there is not treatment available for someone with CHF. That person is not able to get a heart transplant or a lung transplant for COPD, just to talk in big abrasive terms. Um, that person is just, we're just kind of um, taking care of their, we're providing treatment for their symptoms. So they're having trouble breathing, shortness of breath, things like that. So they tend to have a lot of hospitalizations because she can't breathe because of her CHF or her COPD. Um, and then she's in the hospital, maybe she goes to therapy for a little while at the nursing home, she's back home again, and the cycle starts again. Maybe the cycle is a two year cycle at first, but then it starts getting shorter where those hospitalizations become more frequent. That person does not have any treatment available. So a doctor then would say to that daughter or family member to the patient that really what we're doing is just comfort care. We're just treating those symptoms that you have. That person could be eligible to have to use their hospice benefit, even though to the, to the lay person, they're not at end of life, but they truly are at end of life. We don't know when end of life is. We don't have a crystal ball to say that, but statistically they fit into what Medicare says is they're at end of life and they're able to use their Medicare benefit because they have all these things going on. They've had the frequent hospitalizations, they're having weight loss, they're having infections, things like that. Um, so what we're doing is we're taking care of their symptoms and providing comfort care. The difference between palliative and hospice is that palliative, you can also be pursuing treatment. So a good black and white example is someone has a cancer diagnosis. So they have stage four breast cancer, they are 75 years old, and they are going to pursue treatment. So they're going to do chemotherapy and radiation, but they're having symptoms of pain, let's say. They could be eligible to use to have palliative care. Palliative care can begin at the diagnosis, and it can happen during the same time that they're, that they're um, having treatment. Palliative care, actually, I'm going to go to this next slide. Um, is the bridge between treatment often and hospice care. And really the goal is to keep someone out of the hospital. So they're, in that case scenario I gave with the person with breast cancer, they're doing their treat, their chemotherapy or their radiation at the cancer center, but they're having symptoms of pain. They don't wanna keep going to the hospital or they don't wanna go to the hospital at all because they're in pain. What we can provide, actually Hospice of Michigan is rolling this out January 1, so you're the first group that's actually even hearing about it is that you could actually have a doctor make a home visit or a virtual visit. So it might be a home visit at first, face-to-face, -face, and then a virtual visit in the future that can see you and help provide um, treatment for your symptoms. So like in that case, in that scenario, pain management. So there are all your um, narcotics or anything you might need to keep your pain managed will be taken care of. It's similar to an ologist office. I wrote that actually on the slide. So when you see a cardiologist, you see a cardiologist only maybe a couple times a year or every other month if something's going on, maybe monthly if something's going on, or you're seeing um, a cardiologist, somebody uses as the example, the oncologist would be another ologist. So it's not that someone you're seeing all the time, you're not gonna see them every week, but a nurse practitioner or a doctor could come to your home and manage your symptoms 
in between your treatment that you're doing like here at the cancer center. So what will happen in the near future here is that Dr. Hitzelberger will be sending um, some of those cancer patients that are having symptoms to Hospice of Michigan for palliative care. They're not on hospice yet. Um, maybe they won't come on hospice, maybe they'll never be ready, but if they are, then they've already met us and are familiar with us. But the key is to keep them out of the hospital. They want to pursue their treatment and keep their um, symptoms managed, like in that example, their pain managed. Um, there are people that use palliative care um, for other things, so COPD. Maybe someone is not ready for hospice yet, but they're having a lot of hospitalizations. They don't want to go to the hospital anymore, but they need help managing that breathing. Again, it's that gap between they're not ready for hospice yet, maybe emotionally not ready there yet, but they want some added support at home. They can do palliative care. So we're treating their symptoms. We're doing comfort care. They're not, in this case, they're not pursuing anything aggressive because nothing was available, but we're helping them manage their breathing. And they don't want to keep going to the pulmonologist's office or end up in the um, emergency room. So they can use palliative care. And the goal is to keep them home, feeling well, their quality of life the best that it can be, and not in the hospital. And then on our end, the key is that they will become familiar with us and we'll be able to educate them. And hopefully they're emotionally gonna be ready for hospice when they're ready one day. So palliative care, any questions about that? Is that covered under Medicare? It is, I didn't add it to the slide, it is covered under Medicare. Now there might be, um, again, because I don't know all the individual policies, it's not covered at 100% like um, hospices, so I'll get into that, but there are a lot of supplemental policies I've seen that are covering palliative care visits. Um, each policy is a little bit different, so it might pick up your copay, it might pick up the full visit, um, but it is a covered benefit, just not always at 100%. Thank you. All right, hospice care, end of life care. We talked about that earlier. Um, I, I will say it again though, we don't have a crystal ball. A lot of times I meet families that should have been on hospice four months prior or a month prior and I'm meeting them and they're only gonna be on hospice for maybe 30 days or 45 days. Hospice is designed, it is designed as a six month benefit. Um, however, I have patients that are been on hospice for over a year. Um, I've had patients that have been on over for two years, but right now I don't have anyone that's on my services that's been over two, but I've got patients that have been on hospice for over a year. Um, a lot of times people come on the hospice, when they come on the hospice earlier than later, um, statistically people live longer. That's always blows my mind um, when I even say it again out loud, but when I first got into hospice and realized that, that was an amazing thing to let people know. The reason why people will live longer when they're on hospice earlier is we're taking care of them in their own home setting and we're managing symptoms before they're out of control. Um, so we're managing them when they're not making decisions in a crisis. So we already know their diagnosis. We can educate the family and the caregivers as to what's going to happen with that diagnosis. So again, in like situation with um, CHF or congestive heart failure, we know what statistically what that disease looks like as it progresses. Um, again, there's no treatment available. That person isn't able to get a heart transplant or any big surgeries that's gonna change their outcome of their CHF. So we're just maintaining them, their quality of life. Um, we look at quality of life over quantity of life. Um, quantity would be an example would be when someone has that cancer diagnosis and they're doing the chemotherapy, that's to, to give them more quantity. A lot of times cancer patients end up coming to us because in the example here in Alpena, Dr. Hitzelberger has a discussion about quality versus quantity. They can continue to, with treatment, but their quality of life on that treatment isn't always great. So again, this is a true story. A 97 year old with lung cancer doing chemotherapy, his quality of life diminished the day that he started chemotherapy. That family, when they finally came to hospice said, why, I, I, the, actually the patient said, if I would have known I would feel this bad, I wouldn't have done it. So there's that example of you've got to have that talk of quality versus quantity. It extended his life, but the quality of his life wasn't that great um, going through the treatment that was available to him. Hospice allows people to age in place, so we keep them out of the hospital. Doesn't mean you can't go to the hospital, that's a myth. 
um, but it keeps people out of the hospital. The one thing I always bring up to people when they say they want to go to the hospital, which is totally okay, is no one ever leaves the hospital, I hate to say it, better in the sense of you're stronger and you back to right where you were before the onset of whatever happens. Now, they're there to, to um, fix whatever is wrong, that acute problem at the moment, but usually people leave the hospital weaker, tired, even at our age, at my age. Um, you have a hospitalization and you're exhausted and you're weaker and it takes you a couple of weeks to get back to where you were before the onset started of something. So when it comes to someone at the end of life that has a lot of things that are on their plate, a hospitalization a lot of times can speed up the process because they're weaker and they're not as strong as they, they were before the onset of that situation. Um, we provide education for the family and the caregivers to teach them how to take care of their loved one, again, in the comfort of their own home, wherever their home is. Um, another example of hospice, since with Hospice of Michigan, we're, 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 we cover most of the Lower Peninsula. We have patients um, on our Detroit team right now that are living under a bridge um, because they choose to. They are homeless, and that's where they are. Um, they don't want to go to a homeless shelter, so our nurses, nurses actually see them under the bridge where they live and that's okay that is their home um, so I always kind of give that as a as an example we meet people where they are um, you have 24 7 support or a phone call away that part is nice so three o'clock in the morning and a patient's having a symptom of whatever that might be they can that family member can call the 888 number the, a nurse answers the phone with the electronic medical records now we can see everything that's going on with that patient the chart comes up they can actually triage um, with the family member over the phone. And if needed, they're dispatching a nurse to head to the home at three o'clock in the morning. So that happens every night here in, in our area. Um, and they have access to the physician, the home, and the RN, as well as in the earlier slides, all the different um, disciplines that we offer, a hospice aid, uh, spiritual care, uh, the volunteers coming in, um, social work. So all of that comes with hospice care. And that is covered at traditional Medicare at 100%. Hospice questions. Okay, I'm going to do one last slide on hospice. When do I call hospice? Um, I'm just going to run through some of these things. Again, the biggest thing that my team here is, I wish we would have called hospice sooner. Hospice is a scary, scary word. Um, I hope earlier that it resonates that um, people that earlier someone comes out to hospice when they're medically eligible to use their hospice benefit, they live longer. Um, it keeps people out of the hospital for those frequent hospitalizations. Um, and it's covered, it's a, it's a covered benefit that Medicare gives. Medicare doesn't give a whole lot at 100%. Hospice is one of them. Hospice also, another myth of it is that you can change your mind. You can come on hospice for a few months, people get better. Sometimes they're not medically eligible to stay on hospice and use their benefit because they get better. They're not able. They come off of their hospice benefit and it's there again when they need it, um, whenever that is and they're eligible to use it again. You can also choose to come off of hospice. So there are patients that will come off of hospice because they are getting better and they decide to go back and, you, and do aggressive treatment. So maybe they are deciding to go to the nursing home and do some physical therapy, or maybe they are deciding back to going to chemotherapy and they wanna try chemotherapy. That's okay to do as well. And that's something that people don't realize. Um, so back to when I call hospice, when they're not advancing or participating in therapy, so that's back to like the nursing home, someone's at the nursing home, maybe they're doing physical therapy after hospitalization. And an example I gave earlier, they weren't progressing, Medicare says you're done with your days. A lot of times those patients are, are eligible to use their hospice benefit. Weight loss is another one. People see people in their home, maybe they haven't been to the doctor in a few years, but they're losing weight and it's unexplainable. Maybe it's explainable because they have slowed down and they're eating and they're not eating as much because they're not moving around as much. There's other things going on. Multiple hospitalizations in the last six months. Um, advanced illness or compounding comorbidities. So those are the examples I gave earlier. Someone that has congestive heart failure and they have COPD and they're diabetic. Um, a lot of times those advanced illnesses um, get to the point where they're not just chronic, but they truly are in advanced prognosis and they're able to use their hospice benefit. Cognitive abilities, um, that's a tough one sometimes with dementia, because sometimes that can start a lot earlier, Alzheimer's, um, but that's an indicator to call hospice. 
lack of response to treatment, increased dependence for ADL. So ADLs, I mentioned it earlier, those are your activities of daily living. Those are the first, some people say six, some people say seven, things that you do first thing in the morning. You ambulate, you get out of bed, you use the toilet, you dress yourself, you walk. Those are the basic things that you do. When people need more help doing those things, there are times that someone is eligible to use their hospice benefit. Um, the, family, the family or the patient says, I don't go to the hospital anymore. Back to the frequent hospitalizations. I don't want to go to the hospital. That's time that hospice can get called in for an evaluation. Um, you're at risk for the hospital readmission, um, or you hear a doctor say there is, there is no more treatment. It could be in a cancer situation. It could be in, at the pulmonologist. There's no more treatment available. Those are indicators when you call hospice. Um, this is my last slide. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Wendy, one of the things I always want to make sure people understood uh, was the difference between um, hospice being full-time care versus 24-hour support. Yeah. Essentially, hospice does not provide round-the-clock care. It's on call around the clock. So that's a big difference that people need to go into prepared for in terms of arranging for care, whether it's through the family or private duty. Um, so sometimes folks are, are uh, confused about that particular issue. Yeah, it's um, I'm going to stop sharing so I can see everyone. So yeah, there's a lot of people tend to get confused and think that, um, oh, hospice is going to move in with us. That does not happen. We are just a phone call away. Um, now, a caveat to that is there are some hospice houses in our area, um, and I can't tell you, one of, actually my competitor, McLaren, had, um, they did have a hospice house in Sheboygan. I don't know if it's open anymore, um, but it was in Sheboygan. Here in our area, we don't have a hospice house. Um, hospice of Michigan actually has a hospice um, facility in Ann Arbor. We actually own um, Arbor Hospice as well. And so we do have a facility downstate that people tend to use. And those, um, another kind of myth with that is it is a private pay situation or if you have Medicaid, sometimes Medicaid will put some money towards that um, or a long-term care policy. But typically it's private pay even at a hospice house. Hospice or Medicare will pay for the hospice benefit, but not the room and board portion. So not the room and board for the patient. Um, so that's also a myth as well. But you're right, Marsha, it's not 24 seven, someone living in your house. We are there to teach people how to care for their loved one. Um, if they're unable to, or they don't have someone available, that happens in our area as well. We talk about placement and that again, goes back to advanced care planning and what you wish, what your wishes are. Do you have someone that can help you make decisions um, if, you're, if you become unable to, um, so to make sure that those wishes are, are carried through. Um, and where do you want to go? If, do you want to go to a nursing home or an AFC home or assisted living? Those are discussions that hopefully people have had, but not everyone does. Uh oh, did it freeze? I think Marsha froze. Oh, she's back. <laughs> does anyone have any other questions for me? Wendy, thank you. Because you kind of you've explained cleared away some of the fog about the differences and um, especially in the hospice care. I had no idea that there were two different types and that you could be eligible before you're actually at end of life. That's yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I my experience. I've had experience with hospice with my parents, but that was a long time ago. And um, I think it's you probably have changed and over the years too. Definitely things have changed. I think it's sometimes just educating and get it out there. When someone's medically aid eligible to use that benefit, it's really a continuum of our health care that people don't look at it that way. It's they immediately it's like doom and gloom if that word comes up. Oh no, 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 my mom's not my mom's not terminal. You know, she's not terminal. But really she fits the statistics of she is medically eligible to use that benefit. It's a continuum of care. 
So the nice part is hospice can come in, especially in those examples after a hospitalization, um, or just a big decline. I've got, I had someone that called yesterday. They just came up to visit, you know, the, the kids live downstate. They came up to visit mom and dad and mom really had a big change. They saw that the neighbor said, call hospice of Michigan. And the daughter was like, oh no, 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 she's not ready. But we went in and she was medically eligible. That now gives that daughter a peace of mind that there's an entire team of people caring for her because her outcome is not gonna change. There's no cure for what she has going on. She's just aging. There used to be, um, back to like diagnoses, and actually Marsha would probably remember this in her um, background is, Medicare has changed throughout the years, um, the diagnoses that we can use for someone to be eligible. And it used to be failure to thrive, like we'd get that, or someone just failure to thrive. That technically now is not, um, a diagnosis that we can use. So we have to dig a little deeper. So maybe they have atherosclerosis, like hardening of the arteries, and that would then give them that diagnosis. But really, they're not showing like, you know, mom doesn't have, she didn't have a heart attack, for example. She didn't have anything major like a lay person would think, but she was eligible to use her hospice benefit. Again, it's like that unknown. And now they have an entire team. And statistically, I already can say that lady will live longer because she's at home she's they're going to call us when she needs help and not light up the first responders are going to light up her driveway at three o'clock in the morning and bring her to the hospital and what do we do and it's all chaos because we know her we know what's going on we know all the medication she's on we're going to be able to take care of her right in her own home and carry through her wishes and the wishes of her spouse and her family that she wants to be at home um, there are people, like I said, way in the beginning of our presentation today, there are people walking around Walmart on hospice. People don't realize, but they're medically eligible to use their hospice benefit. And we want people to have the best quality of life. Like I always say when I meet with families, we want our job is for you to have the best day possible today. We don't worry about what happened yesterday and we don't worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. We want you to feel well today. And what can we do? So if it's going to the grocery store or going up to Kanabi's this weekend, go do it. And we want to make sure their family or their caregiver has everything they need to do that. If it's the DME, like a walker, a wheelchair, we want to make sure they have um, to do and go continue to do what you want to do. But we're here to support them and help them when needed. Good. Anything else for me? Wendy, you're with Hospice of Michigan. You referred to McLaren. So are there a number of places that provide hospice services and that and how does one learn what's in their own area or which which of these different hospice programs to choose? So in our area, so in Alpena proper, I'm gonna say there are three in Alpena County. Let's go to Alpena County. There's Hospice of Michigan. There's Compassus and there's McLaren Hospice. Those are the three available here. Um, I can't speak specifically about each company because obviously I work for Hospice of Michigan. Um, I can just tell you what I do know. Um, Compassus is a nation, na it's a nationwide company. They also in other areas of even the state, they also do home care and they are a for-profit company. Some people that does not matter to um, but that's the little bit I know that you could just even Google about Compassus. They have an office in Atlanta, but they also cover Alpena County. Um, McLaren is owned by McLaren Hospital. Um, they also have home care in like Rogers City area and like Presqu'ile, and I think even a little bit in north of Alpena. Um, mm -hmm. And they're owned by McLaren Hospital. And then Hospice of Michigan, we are um, the oldest hospice in the state. We um, are company started, it was actually started by Blue Cross Blue Shield in like 1981, 82, when Medicare made hospice a uh, benefit. So hospice started off as a volunteer organization way back when, and there's a whole history there. Um, actually nurses that would volunteer and take care of patients in the home is how hospice started. Medicare realized that that's what people want to do is to be at home. And they also realized it saved a lot of money of hospitalizations for people. So they be it became a benefit in like 1980. 182. Um, that's when Hospice of Michigan started. We've always been the largest nonprofit hospice in the state, but actually now we're the largest hospice in the state. Um, we've bought a few other smaller hospices, 
Um, so that's all that we do. We do palliative care, which kind of falls under the same umbrella of hospice. We do pediatrics. A lot of the other, actually, the two hospices in our area, they do not do peds. Um, we take anyone that, that is able, um, anyone that's medically eligible to use their hospice benefit. Um, it does not matter on their diagnosis, and it does not matter on their ability to pay, whether they have insurance, don't have insurance, underinsured, we accept everyone. And that's where you hear people donating to hospice. Um, that's one of the things that quality of life funds that we'll go to are people that are underinsured or don't have insurance or like the pediatrics patients. So that's all that we do. Um, so we feel for our for us that Hospice of Michigan is the best at it because we don't dabble in any other aspect other than end of life care. Um, me, myself in our area, as I started off in the beginning, we tend to be, many of us on our team, just tend to be all things senior. So we get a lot of phone calls of, similar to this talk that I did today is, what do I do about senior housing? What do I do about Meals on Wheels? My mom needs Meals on Wheels. How do I do that? How do I get added support? Um, and we tend to be kind of the, the, um, the resource for all things seniors in our area, just because of where we um, work with so many different referral sources in the area. That was like a really long answer to your question, Kathy. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. It was a lot of information, you guys. I, it's got to be a little overwhelming, but I hope you had some questions answered. Thank you for that comment, Susan. Um, hopefully it clear, cleared up a few things and answered. I, that last slide, I know this is being recorded, has my um, contact information and Marsha has it as well. You are welcome to call me or email me if you have any specific questions and if it's something I don't know. I think, Kathy, you mentioned some insurance um, questions. Maybe if you want to email me or call me. And I'm happy to. Did I lose her? Uh, okay, I'll do that. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Please, please reach out and I will try to direct you in the right area to so someone to help you. Um, but feel free to contact me anytime, even in the future, um, with questions. I'm happy to help. Thank you so much, Wendy. You are a wonderful asset and resource for us, so I always appreciate you. Thank you. So feel free to contact her. As again, we were saying, we have that on the uh, information uh, for this chart. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks. Wendy. We'll see you later.